Hi, and welcome back to Psychology with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we're going to start in on some of the most basic fundamentals of psychology and how people learn, and that is the concept of classical conditioning. Your learning targets for today, we're going to analyze the basic principles of classical conditioning, what it is, uh, what it involves, some things about it. We will identify ways that classical conditioning can help people or animals adapt to their environment, and we will discuss how classical conditioning can be applied to everyday society. So let's talk about a case study, which is the Little Albert case, and this was done by uh, John Watson. And the Little Albert experiment basically is a baby and this baby was uh, raised in a hospital. It was a sickly baby. It never left the hospital. So it was never exposed to things in daily life like fire, uh, animals, uh, even basic toys it had never seen before. Um, so what Watson did, and this is a very unethical experiment today, was that he showed that emotional reactions can be trained into people through classical conditioning. So 11 month old Albert was conditioned to fear a white rat rather than be amused by it. And they would do this by pairing the rat with something that Albert would find instinctively frightening. Um, they put the rat out and then they would bang a, p a, p a, um, a bar, bang a bar on a pole and make a loud sound. Um, they would basically make Albert uh, scared of the rat and so eventually after enough pairings whenever Albert saw this rat he would instinctively start crying because he would think that something scary was going to happen and Albert's fear even spread to similar objects like the white fur they gave it they showed Albert a white fur coat he was afraid of that they showed him a rat like a mouse mask that was white and he was afraid of that and so this experiment has basically shown us that classical conditioning is possible. And this was a case study involving a baby in the hospital. Conditioning is a type of learning that involves stimulus response connections. So you're shown a stimulus, you're going to respond in a certain way to it. If you're sprayed in the face with water, you automatically blink and flinch. You don't have to learn that. Classical conditioning is when one stimulus calls forth the response that is usually called forth by another stimulus. And just get that definition down, and if it sounds confusing, I'll walk you through it here in a second. Here are the five main definitions of classical conditioning. And this paragraph up top, although long, does explain exactly how it works. So. Before conditioning begins, an unconditioned stimulus brings forth an unconditioned response. So unconditioned means it is not conditioned. It doesn't have to be learned. If you get sprayed in the face with water, you're going to blink. You're going to flinch to protect your eyes. That does not have to be learned. During conditioning, we can pair a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. And so the unconditioned stimulus would be the water. The neutral stimulus would be a certain word that is said. In the resulting condition, after conditioning, the neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. So in this case, the word would cause the flinch. And you'll get to see this in our experiment. But the conditioned stimulus brings forth a conditioned response. So basically, a lot of times in psychology this year, I'm going to ask you a situation and you need to identify what the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the neutral stimulus, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response are. But you only really have to know three because the neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus are always the same. And the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are always the same. So you really only have to know the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, and the neutral stimulus, because we know those other two are the same as these two. Russian physiologist Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov, used dogs 
in his studies of classical conditioning. He originally was trying to measure uh, salivation of dogs when they found food, but he trained the dogs inadvertently to associate the sound of a bell with food. If any of you have pets, maybe you use a can opener or get into the treat cupboard, your dog or your cat knows that that is where you keep food and they may start to salivate, they may come running at the sound of can opener even if you're opening a can of green beans unless you feed your dog green beans. But they learned that the sound of the bell meant food was coming. So even in this experiment, um, Pavlov would ring a bell and give them food, ring a bell and give them food, ring a bell and give them food. Over enough times, as soon as the dogs heard the bell, they knew food was coming. And so they started salivating. Even before they got the food, they ha were trained to associate the bell with food. So here is classical conditioning in action in this experiment. The unconditioned stimulus is the food. The unconditioned response is salivation. So the food causes salivation. That doesn't have to be learned. Also, before conditioning, we can introduce a bell, or in this case, a tuning fork, to basically cause nothing. If a dog hears a tuning fork, he's not going to do anything. No conditioned response. But during conditioning, if we pair the two together, literally introduce the tuning fork and the food at the same time, that causes salivation. Pretty soon, we can remove the unconditioned stimulus, and it will cause salivation on its own. Now let's go over the concept of taste aversions and how this classical conditioning can actually help people and animals. A taste aversion is a learned response to a particular food. So in the case of, let's say, food poisoning. Has anyone ever had food poisoning? I have. In college, I went to Dairy Queen forever for the first time um, to get a hot food, like a hamburger. So I got a hot hamburger from Dairy Queen and was throwing up for days. And so that took me one time to learn that even though I'm sure I could convince myself that it was just the one hamburger there, I still haven't been back to Dairy Queen to get another hamburger. It took me one time, and the consequences of eating that were so awful that I just don't want to go through that again, so I don't eat Dairy Queen hot food anymore. Cold food's fine. Extinction is the disappearance of the conditioned response when the unconditioned stimulus no longer follows the conditioned stimulus. So in the case of Pavlov's dog, what if we discontinue pairing the tuning fork and the food? Pretty soon, if we give them the tuning fork but no food, they're going to relearn that, okay, this guy's just messing with us and ringing a tuning fork, but he's not actually going to give us food. That's the extinction of the conditioned response. The spontaneous recovery means that if we start pairing them together again, it will take less time for the dog to realize that, okay, he's going to start giving us food again when he rings that bell or hits that tuning fork. And then generalization and discrimination are basically you respond to things that are similar to the stimuli that you have been introduced to. So if we, um, base, we with the Pavlov's dog experiment, we could try different notes, different tones, different pitches um, in order to see if they would generalize that. It, is it the hitting of the tuning fork or is it the pitch of the tuning fork that they realize they're going to get food? Um, we could do experiments for that. Discrimination is the act of responding differently to stimuli that are not similar to one another. So um, what if I hit a drum? Would the dog know that it was getting food? You know, probably not. It would probably discriminate between those two things. And then finally, we can apply this by using three things, what are called flooding and systematic desensitization. In flooding, and this is kind of... Uh, this is uh, not used a lot anymore, but let's say a person is afraid of snakes. You would put them in a room of harmless snakes until the fear responses to that stimulus is uh, gone. And it's, it basically would cause the person so much anxiety that it could do more damage, but flooding used to be used a lot to, to get used um, uh, to get people over phobias. And with systematic desensitization, 
people learn relaxation techniques and they are gradually exposed to the stimulus that they fear. So if a person was afraid of snakes, we would teach them to just think about snakes and then relax themselves. And then maybe we would watch a, see a picture of a snake and teach them to relax. Then a video of a snake, then re teach them to relax. Then maybe we'd introduce a snake in a cage in, on the far side of the room and we could move it closer to the person. Then we would gradually get the snake out of the cage until they weren't afraid anymore. So step by step, and this could be over a matter of months or years, we introduce the person to the thing that causes fear um, little by little until they're not afraid of it anymore and it doesn't cause any more anxiety. And lastly, in counter conditioning, we basically put a pleasant stimulus paired repeatedly with a fearful one, counteracting the fear. And there's also the opposite of that. We put an unpleasant stimulus um, with a pleasurable one, let's say as alcohol. And in alcohol, you, there's a drug that you can take that if you consume alcohol at that point, it will make you throw up, thereby pairing vomiting with drinking alcohol and basically learning that connection and that pairing. And that is all we have for classical conditioning. I know it was a lot today, but it's a very important concept in psychology. Next time we'll talk about operant conditioning when the reinforcement or the stimulus happens after an action and not actually with the action. So be excited.